So I did my, my, my college in Brazil and then in the Southeast. I'm from uh, Minas Gerais state, which is Southeast near Rio de Janeiro. My hometown is really close to Rio. And I did my undergrad, my college there in my hometown. And then I moved, I graduated in 2009. And then I moved to the Amazon and did my master's there in Federal University of Amazonas, Amazonas State in North of Brazil. And always with working on entomopathogens. And then I, I, I did my PhD in Penn State. Then I moved to US. <clears throat> And when I was doing a Penn State, when uh, I was working with David Hughes, he was my PhD advisor. So I worked with David Hughes and Harry Evans from CABI. They are both my mentors, official mentors. And <clears throat> when I finished the PhD, I moved to Brazil again, but still working, working for Penn State as a postdoc, but uh, based in Brazil. And 2019, I moved to Japan so I stayed one year in Japan working on entomopathogens and also studying endosymbionts that we'll be talking a little bit at the end of the talk. And, and then I got a, a, a postdoc position offer here at University of Florida. So I moved here six months ago in July. And a few weeks ago, I got a job offer. Unfortunately, I, I, I will not yet say where because it's not official. So I don't think it would be would be good to, to say something that will that didn't happen officially. But I might have my own lab starting July. So hopefully by the end of this week, everything will be officialized. And so that would be great to collaborate with, with your club in the next years and decades. And that's, that's a little bit of what I've been doing in, in the, the past years. So now jumping into the, the presentation, so I've been uh, working on, on entomopathogens. Well, let me step back a little bit. In my, my college, I started working with mushroom taxonomy. So I published, I think, two or three papers on mushroom taxonomy. But then when I watched a, a BBC movie, a BBC video that is on YouTube showing the, that fungi that grows from the back of the end, I, that changed my, my life. And it blew my mind. So I, 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 I will work with dead organisms. I, I, I don't want to work with mushrooms. This is, this is absolutely crazy. And a mushroom growing out of an insect. So how cool is that? And then I switched to uh, anthropopathogens in my master's 2010 and never left the field. And will never leave the field again. So th that's what I've been doing in the last years. So in my, during my master's, I worked mostly on understanding the ecology of them and, and doing lots of field trips, field work all the time. In the, I, I was living in the Amazon, so was, the forest was literally on my, my backyard. So I could go easily to the forest and I spent like many, many months in the forest. And that was really good. So I learned a lot how to collect this uh, fungi. They are usually really small. And, and so you need to know where to look for them. And each group of species uh, lead the host, let me say lead the host to die in a specific location or uh, bury in the soil or on the leaf litter or biting onto a leaf in the case of the zombie ants or many other ways. And then to, in, in my masters, I switched to the entomopathogens and the zombie ants and doing ecology and mostly field, field studies. And my PhD, I moved to do taxonomy, alpha taxonomy, like describing species based on, on their morphology and also the molecular phylogenies. So I, I, I learned how to do uh, phylogenies based on molecular, uh, molecular data. Th that also opens for really interesting questions I will present in, in the talk. Uh, for example, how these uh, fungi evolved with their hosts and what these uh, traits evolved, for example, the behavior manipulation, how it evolved, which forces uh, ha uh, occurred in, in this lineage that made them to develop this new strategy. So I will be touching this along the talk. So just let's move on a little. And so fungi, as you might know, maybe even better than I know. So fungi are really, really diverse. So we have about one, 135,000 species described 
but estimations uh, range from 600,000 to even to 10 million species yet to be described. Uh, but most of the uh, diversity of the uh, fungi we know is on mushrooms or plant parasites or mycorrhizal associations, which are also, many of them are mushrooms or lichens or, or decomposers in, in general. But we, we know very little about the about entomopathogens. So entomopathogens are the, the name that we give to pa parasites of insects or parasites of arthropods. Even though they are not insects, we call everything entomopathogens to make it simple. We call uh, spider parasite as entomopathogen, for example. So my, my biggest question was in the beginning of my, my, my PhD, I didn't know how diverse this, this group uh, were. So I started to study them in a broad sense. So which uh, groups um, in, uh, reach the insect body and which groups of insects are able to exploit the insect body to get their nutrition? And then my, my first step in my PhD was to uh, do a, a big review of the diversity of entomopathogens and, and describe each of the groups based on, on fungal phyla, which of groups of each of these fungal phyla uh, infected insects. Because when we say entomopathogens, it's not one single lineage that evolved this ability to infect insects and then they, they diversified. There are many, many different uh, lineages that evolve independently along the, the, the evolution uh, of, of fungi. So here I will explore uh, a little bit more about the diversity of, of them in general. So basidiomycetes are really, really diverse and there are lots of mushrooms and or wood decaying fungi and rust fungi, plant parasites, but there's really, really uh, very few lineages uh, that infect insects. Uh, one example is the uh, uh, this, uh, this fungi here that they grow on the, the called septobasidium. They grow on scale insects that uh, usually the parasitize uh, citrus trees. And, and what these fungi do, if we look at the figure on the right, so we see the, the bark in the, 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 the bottom part is the, the, the tree bark and the upper part is a, the a fungal. So you can see the, the, the hyphae. And, and this insect that is in the middle of the image is the scale insect. We see this straw that goes up to the, uh, down to the flowing to get the nutrition from, from the, the plant. And what the fungi do is grow a hyphae that grows inside this insect, but they don't kill the insect. They just use the insect as a gateway into the plant. So the fungi grow in the insect and infect them inside, but don't kill them and they, they go in, down to the plants to get nutrition from the plants. So the insect is just a straw for the fungus to suck the nutrients from the plant. And this is one of the, the few lineages that infect insects in basidiomycetes. Another one is a, a Fibular rhizoctonia. I did include here is a, they, they mimic uh, eggs of termites. So when the termites find some sclerotia, which is a, a, a round structure, a resistant structure of, of fungi, so when termites find these uh, uh, sclerotia in nature, they bring them inside the nest and, and take care of them if the, it was a, a termite nest, a termite egg. So as soon as the, the fungi gets uh, uh, run out of nutrition, they switch from saprophytic to parasitic and they start to colonize the whole nest and the whole uh, pile of eggs, which the, the, the termite brought uh, the fungi in. So it can, it can kill termites, especially the termite eggs. So they're right. just these well, two lineages. Yeah. Well, can, can we, because we know we have some brand new members. Mm -hmm. They might need just a little review of mm -hmm. some of the terms, like even hyphae or saprophyte or basidiomycete. Right. Are you okay with just going like- Of course. Okay. Yeah. So um, hyphae is the, is that we call, um, uh, these fungal filaments, we, we call them hyphae. So we have vegetative hyphae that are uh, responsible to uh, absorb nutrients and, 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 and provide nutrition for, for the fungi. And the, the, for example, the basidiomycetes, they form basidiocarps and ascomycetes form ascocarps. 
And those are the, the so-called fruiting bodies. We, we don't use that too much in the scientific literature, but they're called in the general public called them fruiting bodies. And there are different, uh, several different groups of fungi. The most, uh, not the most important, but the most common ones are basidiomycetes, which are mushrooms. The most uh, famous ones are mushrooms. Ascomycetes, for example, these zombie ants are ascomycetes and truffles, uh, not truffles, the um, morals are, are ascomycetes, for example. So they're, they're a phyla, they're called a different phyla. So th those are really above, uh, below kingdom. We have kingdom fungi, phylum basidomycota, for example, or ascomycota. And uh, what was the other term? Sa saprophyte is a fungus that uh, feed from uh, uh, dead, dead things, dead, uh, dead animals, dead plants, and any uh, nutrition that, that can make from uh, dead things, for example, bread, and, and so on. And so if, if I say anything that, that might be dubious, or, or I can clarify better, just please interrupt me anytime. And so, yeah, and, and well, I was gonna say, and one of the ways that you tell an ascomycete from a basidio is how how the um, spore structure. Yeah, the spore producing cells are are very different. In yeah. basidiomycetes, they usually uh, look like a, uh, what's the name of the the cow uter. Yeah, the, the cow that when produced milk. Oh, the udder. 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 Yeah, yeah. Right. So it looks like an udder. So you have the, the, the big cell and we have like the spores are formed outside of this structure. And the ascomycetes, the, the ascus that, that named the group, it's a, like a sack. We have the spores inside. So it forms inside. So that, that's the, the biggest uh, character that can uh, differentiate both groups. But there are many others like... Um, uh, clan connections is one, while ascomycetes have different types of, of scepter. And there are many other ways to, to uh, recognize them. And, but uh, this case here I'm, I'm showing the bees, a microsporidium is another phylum. It was relatively recently uh, integrated into the, the, the fungi as one of the most basal lineages in, in fungi. So before it was considered something else but now is considered as one of the most ancient lineages of fungi. And these are ob obligate paras uh, intracellular parasites of uh, many, many organisms, uh, any mammals, insects. But here is a life cycle that I, I drew to show how the infect of microsporidiums um, occur in the insect. So the letter A is the B, so it has to ingest the spores. One of the few examples that the, the, the infection occur by ingestion and not by ac actively penetrating the cuticle. So this is one of the few examples. So the bee will uh, eventually ingest these spores and these spores will, will become active in the gut. So as, as, as soon as they recognize the gut, they will shoot this uh, like a harpoon that, that is like coiled inside the cell. So this shoot a harpoon and will inject their cytoplasm inside the, 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 the host cell. So once the cytoplasm is inside the host cell, it starts to, um, to multiply and form many different other spores that will mature. And once they fill up the cell, this cell will burst and will, uh, will release all these spores into the, the host body that will release in the environment, that will, uh, again will be ingested by another one and so on. So this is one of the few examples of intracellular parasite. Uh, another group is the blastocladiomycota that we can call also as chytrids, which are um, uh, aquatic fungi. So this life cycle is interesting because it requires two different hosts, uh, a mosquito larva and a copepod called cyclops. <laughs> so uh, as we see here on the, on the copepod phase, it, as soon as it infects the, 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 the copepod, it starts to multiply inside the body. And once the copepod is dead, it releases all these uh, flagellated spores in the water. So these uh, plus and minus or male and female uh, spores, which are compatible with each other, they will merge and form another cell with two flagellum that will infect now a mosquito larva. 
So once this mosquito larva is infected, again, it's the same thing. The fungi will reproduce a lot inside the host body. And as soon as this um, host dies, it will release these uh, structures in F that is uh, like eggs filled with fungal spores that once they are released in the water and they are mature, they will, they will open and release all these flagellated spores that will uh, infect another copepod. But one very interesting aspect in this uh, relationship is that if the, the fungi do, uh, do not kill the, 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 the host, it will pass until the, the mosquito larva becomes an adult. So if it remains inside the, the adult, it will migrate to the ovaries. And once the, the female feed from, the, from, from a person or another mammal, this blood that the female will ingest will make these fungal structures to mature. And once these fungal structures are mature, the, the mosquito will lay these fungal structures instead of their own eggs. So these fungal structures will be laid on the, but interestingly, this mosquito will lay the, these fungal structures in the breeding site, which means that there are lots of other mosquito larvae to be reinfected by, by the fungus. So, and this is a really interesting life cycle for, in many ways. And now, now we're moving to another group. It's called Entomophthoromycota. It is a pretty long name. This used to be among the uh, zygomycetes. We can call them zygomycetes in, in, in a general sense. It's not scientifically correct, but we can refer them as zygomycetes in a popular uh, way. And this fungi, there's many examples. And one of them is Ereniopsis that infect these um, many different groups of flies um, or mosquitoes or beetles in, in this case of the illustration. And as the fungi grow, it will uh, make the, the insect to, to bite on the, onto a plant like the zombie ants. So this behavior manipulation arose multiple times. And this is one lineage that is totally unrelated to the zombie ants, but also do the same thing. The fungi will uh, lead the host to bite onto a plant. And once the, the host is, is there biting the plant, it, the fungi will kill the host. And once the host is killed, the fungi will start to develop inside the body and causes uh, the, the fungal body, to, the, the beetle body to get swollen, swollen, swollen. And the, 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 the wings will start to open because it, the fungi will grow, 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 and the, the, it will open the wings as they usually do to attract their partners to mate. So this is a perfect strategy because once this infected uh, beetle is, in, uh, is infected by the fungi, it, the body, as we can see here on the left, is covered by these uh, fungal cells that will shoot spores. And once the other partner will come to mate with this infected uh, and dead, uh, beetle, they will get infected by the contact. So this uh, open wing display is really important to attract other insects and transmit disease. Uh, another two, two interesting cases and, and really rare that the, the host is, uh, is kept alive after infection. And even while the fungi is sporulating, the host is alive. On, on, on top is a cicada uh, infected by Massospora. So it's called the uh, uh, flying, shaking salts of death, something like that. Because as the cicada is flying, we we'll, uh, spread spores as, as they fly, as they walk around, they, they will actively spread the spores. It's the same case as the, the, the flies when infected by strong wealthy. That is another type of fungus that makes uh, the, the, the fly to make a hole on their abdomen. And this hole is filled with these uh, fungal cells that shoot spores really actively. So those are uh, the two really rare cases where the, the fungi keep the host alive while sporulating. So now I will move into my subject, which is the ascomycetes, and more precisely the order Hippocrealis. So we have kingdom fungi, uh, phylum ascomycota, and order Hippocrealis. So it's uh, just a rank that as we organize the, the, this fungi. So we have phylum, uh, order, and family, and so on. 
So this is uh, to understand how, how these entomopathogens in, in hypocryalian fungi evolved. Cordyceps is one example. So if we compare, this is a phylogeny that's made from the molecular data of insects. So this shows the evolution of insects. So if we compare the evolution of insects on the left with the phylogeny of the fungi on the right, we, we see that both uh, co-evolved at the same time. So as we can see here in these um, red bars, the, they both uh, diversified a lot in the Cretaceous. The, I mean, diversified as every node that we see bifurcating is something that, that uh, event of speciation. So this one lineage became two, and these two lineages became four, and these four lineages became eight. And then we have all these groups uh, uh, that we have uh, extant groups. But the, in the Cretaceous that the diversification occurred. So in the Cretaceous also the plants, the flowering plants diversified. So here we see the diversification of flowering plants, which was followed by the diversification of insects and in their mouth parts. So as the plants evolved, the insects also evolved different mouth parts to exploit these new plants that were evolving with them. And together with the plants evolving and the insects that exploit these plants were also evolving and speciating and diversifying. We also see a really great diversification in the Cretaceous of these fungi. So this means that we see here in the uh, blue dots. So this means that this is a really good indication that entomopathogens, insect and flowering plants evolved together. So that's, that is really um, one topic I, I want to explore in the next years, how this co-evolution occurred between different organisms. Here's uh, another uh, phylogeny, molecular phylogeny. Let me explain. So this is, has about 450 species of the uh, Hippocrealis, the <clears throat> order Hippocrealis. So the branch colors means host association. So we see in dark green is the association with plants. For example, blue means that those species are associated with uh, coleoptera, which are beetles. Red means associated with hymenoptera, which are the ants, for example. And yellow means associated with uh, lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, and so on. So each of these colors means uh, association with a, a certain type of host. So if we start from the beginning, we see that this whole order started associated with uh, plants. We, we don't know yet is if it was as a parasitic association or endosymbiotic association, which is also uh, relatively common in this order. So we see that in the base, in the, the, the first uh, groups, as we see here in the, the yellow, the, this yellow part, I don't know, I, I don't have an arrow to, to point out, but this first part, the, 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 the first quarter uh, here in yellow means that this is a different family. So this family was mostly infecting and associated with plants. As we can see here, most of these uh, branches are uh, colored in dark green and few of them are uh, colored in, in uh, pink and few others are in light green. So this means that there was a host association switch from plants to fungi or from plants to insects, for example. And let me jump now into the three uh, uh, more common families of uh, anthropopathogens, which are cordycipitaceae, clavicipitaceae, and ophiocordycipitaceae. So now I will just zoom in into these three different families to show how they might have evolved based on, on, on my data. So this is the uh, Cordycipitaceae family. Uh, my results show that this family evolved from uh, <clears throat> ancestral infecting fungi. So fungi that infected another fungi, we call them mycoparasites. So in these mycoparasites, they, they, they diversified into two groups. One group was uh, Hypocrella, uh, another group that originated other groups, for example, cord uh, the cordyceps or gibelula that infect spiders. So here we see in purple, uh, these, all these species are infecting spiders. 
uh, rubiella, some acanthomyces, and evansia, in fact, all spiders. So that's why these branches are colored in purple. And so this means that they started infecting fungi and then jumped to infect um, spiders. So from spiders, they were able to jump again to the insects. We don't know yet. We can see here these dashed lines means that that part of the, the evolution of this group is ambiguous. We could not uh, retrieve what was the, 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 the ancestral of that group. So that's why it's uh, dashed lines. But we can see that started infecting fungi, and then jumped to spiders. And then from spiders, they jump most likely to Lepidoptera, which are the most diverse, uh, the most infected hosts in this group. This group uh, comprises cordyceps, which are one of the most uh, famous entomopathogens. On the, on the, at the bottom of the figure, we can see, I don't know if you can read it, but you see cordyce many different types of cordyceps. So that's cordyceptase. So if we, we move to the next family, which is Clavicyptaceae, we see that they, in, they origins is, is very different. They didn't originate it from a mycoparasite, but they originated from an ancestral infecting scale insects, which means the light green. So from this ancestral, we have two different uh, roots. One that has these uh, dashed lines, so we cannot retrieve what was the ancestor of that group that formed metarism, for example, that's uh, heavily infecting uh, Lepidoptera or other hosts, which is a, a general fungi. And <clears throat> we see that the, the bottom in uh, dark green, uh, light green, and there are two branches in, in pink, which is verticillium and tyrannicordyceps. So this means that they are the ancestral infected uh, plants, and then they jump to infect other fungi. So these uh, host jumps occurred many times in this group. That, that's why this group is so diverse ecologically. So they have entomoparasites and they have also endophytes. Uh, there are fungi that leaves and, and benefit the plants. So they live inside the plant uh, body and, and they, they, some of them uh, make them uh, protected against uh, pathogens or herbivores or, and, and other types of threats. So this is a really diverse. And as we can see here, there was multiple jumps from one group to another. Now the last family, which is the one that I, I have focused uh, most of my study, the Ophiocordyceptaceae. And again, is a, a, a totally different story of how the group evolved. So the, the most, uh, the oldest ancestral in this family is uh, related to a, uh, a beetle larva. So the, the ancestor was infecting beetle larva. And then most of the time of the evolution, as we can see all these uh, blue dots here uh, along the tree, means that they diversified, but they still uh, infected beetle larva. And as we see here, when they jump from the beetle larva to the ants, as we see here on the red branches, we, we can see that they jump from beetle to ants and diversified a lot. So this I will be talking more about. And at the bottom, we see a cicada here in, in brown, light brown. So those are endosymbionts of insects. So they don't kill the insects, but they benefit the insects. They, they replace some uh, bacteria that were beneficial to these insects. So this is a really unique family when we have uh, parasites of fungi, parasites of insects and also endo beneficial endosymbionts of uh, insects. So that's just to talk a little bit how this uh, fungi might have evolved. I hope it was clear, but unfortunately I didn't have the, the, the arrow to, to point out where I wanted to, to talk about. So those are a few examples on the so-called zombie ants. So they are uh, fungi that infect ants and they, they, can, they can manipulate the, their behavior just few hours before its death. So making it to die in a specific location that's uh, optimum for the fungi to grow. So here's just a few uh, information about why studying ant, uh, ant pathogens is a good model system to understand evolution between fungi and arthropods because ants are really well known. Their ecology 
uh, are well known, their phylogenetics, relationship, diversity, and the, their behavior is really well known, life history, and they have rich fossil records, which help us to date these phylogenies. So we use fossil records to calibrate phylogenies. So we use those, uh, for example, we have, we found, find a, a fossil that dates from 200, 200 million years ago. So we know that if we find an insect in that piece of um, amber, we know that that insect occurred about 200 million ago. So that's how we, we calibrate uh, the phylogenies. And most importantly, the host remains identifiable after the, the fungal infections. So as after the, 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 fung the entomopathogens infect the host, as, as uh, you, uh, Sam showed us the, the moth that someone found uh, today. So the, the, the host is really difficult to identify because the fungi degrade and destroy the whole body of the insect. But with this hard-bodied insect, it's different. So the ants, even after months, it's dead. It retains some taxonomic uh, features that we can uh, later on ID which ant species were infected by the fungus. So this helps a lot to understand how the, the fungi evolved with their hosts. If, but if we don't know the host ID, we, we cannot study how they evolved. Um, and this, uh, fungi infecting the ants, they evolved multiple times, not just once. So here we see that different morphologies, they are totally different. Loidia, for example, is, is yellow and all the others are more to the brown. So, and, and their spore shape is very different. The fruiting bodies is, is, I'm using fruiting bodies here just to make it easier to understand. And the fruiting bodies are really different among them. We, we can clearly see how different they are. And if we go to the, the microscopy, the, the differences are really more striking. So here is a, the classic zombie ant fungus, which is the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis complex. So that's the most sophisticated uh, group of anthropathogens infecting ants. I say most more sophisticated because their morphology is more complex. They produce uh, different types of spore. They produce sexual spores, asexual spores, many, many different types. And they also have this really complex behavior manipulation, which in other species are more simple as I will show later on. So in the forest, we can easily identify when one ant is infected by, by uh, this type of, of fungus, because it will be invariably biting onto a plant part or biting in a substrate. And these fungi, after they make the host to bite into the, the substrate, they will grow this uh, uh, typical, they, they will have this typical biting behavior, and they will grow this fruiting body. They will grow from uh, the back of the head of the ant and grow this uh, uh, circular round structure called ascoma. So this ascoma that will produce the spores and will shoot into the environment. So cinema is the stalk, is the asexual part. And ascoma is the sexual part, the round one. So if we do a close-up, we see that all these dots are called ostules. So these ostules are really, really small openings that will actively shoot spores from that opening. So, but what is it that below that structure? Though these dots are just, just the, the tip of the iceberg we see. But if we cut this uh, fruiting body, we see this really beautifully arranged, uh, we call them periticia in the singular periticium. So uh, these chambers where they produce the ascos and the acai and the ascospores inside these structures. So these structures are spore producing structures. And once they are mature, they will shoot spores into, into the air that will uh, fall on the forest floor and infect other holes. Here's a short video uh, made uh, by Netflix, which we were talking about uh, uh, consultancy and, and this type of, of things. So I was invited to be the consultant of, of this movie, but I, I was I was doing uh, something else. I couldn't I couldn't leave what I was what I was doing to go to the forest to help them. So after I saw the result, I was I really regretted because it's really beautiful. So this is just a small cut of the video of two two minutes about two minutes. And that will show a species I have described in Colombia two years ago, coincidentally. 
And we will we'll show really beautiful images and, and David Altenborough will, will infecting only ants, but many other different groups of, of hosts. So I will talk more later on. So here's just to illustrate a little bit as Sam asked me to include some personal things as well. So here is a snapshot of a few trips I had done in Amazon, Africa, and Asia. So uh, at the bottom left here is a boat, which was transformed into a lab for two weeks. So I was traveling up Rio Negro in the Amazon and collecting species and, and, and uh, studying them still in the field, still in the boat. So I could, I could dry them later on and bring them to the to US to do Micros microscopy and DNA work. And the upper, upper right, the top right, we see what this was a hotel room in Ghana, Africa. So it, coincidentally, I think that fungi that was showed uh, earlier uh, by that someone found, I think is the same, at least the same genus as this one, Purpura psyllium. So I think it's really similar. So this I found like 30 or 40 in a really small area. So that's called episodics. And at the bottom, at the bottom right is uh, some tick uh, attack that I, I, I got in the Amazon. It was really, really bad. Each of, each of these red dots became blisters. So it was really, really bad. So that, that happens all the time when we're working remote places, but that's how it is. And this is a little bit of the, the Amazonian part. So the boat I was living for uh, two, two weeks and some of the locals that I, I met and cassava plantations and these kind of things. So so this is, to me is one of the best parts of the job. Yeah. Well, I just had, we have one member that has a question about the Ophiocordyceps. All right. And uh, I unmuted him so you could see Jason too. Jason, you want to go ahead and ask your question? I cannot see him, but. Oh. Okay. Maybe, maybe he, he, he wants to keep the question and then we can ask all the questions at the end. Okay, we can do that. All right. All right. All right. So here is showing the, how a taxonomic plate looks like. So how, how describing species looks like in, in uh, cordyceps and ophiocordyceps. So that's the morphological part. So when we go to the field, collect all these fungi, we have to bring them to the lab and make sections, really thin sections. And remember that these are fungi growing from an ant. So they're really, really tiny. So it's really difficult. I use some machines cry, uh, called cryo sectioner. So we can freeze really small pieces of the fungi and, the, and we select in the machine what is the thickness of each slice. So here's about 30 to 40 microns thick. So it's really, really thin. And it, the, using this machine helps a lot to keep the tissue uh, integrity and to keep the morphology really uh, nicely <clears throat> when we prepare the microscopy slides. And so, but how people uh, often ask me, uh, how, how many of these zombie ant species there are? So I, here I, I compile some data of my data and friends data. So I have friends working in Brazil in the ant diversity. So this colleague of mine, he collected over 330, uh, 324 ant species across 27 sites in the Amazon. So many different places. And we found that only 28 of these, uh, the ant gender are infected. So the zombie ant fungi, the, the classic zombie ants, the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis only infects Componotini ants, which is a group of ants uh, that is mostly Componotus and Polyrachis, two different genera of ants. So they are exclusive parasites of these, these groups. So we found that 50% of the Componotus, which is one of the, the ants that are infected, are known to be infected by these zombie ant fungi. So if we extrapolate the total number of these Componotus ants worldwide, which is 1,200 species, if we still consider that 50% of them are infected, as we find in the Amazon, we end up to almost 600 species, only of zombie ants, in, uh, only of Ophiocordyceps 
infecting ants, 600 species waiting to be described just in this group. So this is unbelievable. But at every single time I go to the field, I find many, many new species. There's no exception. If I go in the dry season, I find new species. If I go to the wet season, I find even more new species. So it's a never ending job. So there's many thousands, thousands of species to be described. So as I moved to uh, describing new species, at the end of my PhD, we increased in 82% of the number of parasitic fungal species in this group. So we knew very little and just one student doing his PhD on this topic increases over 80% number of species. And we also increased the number of ant genera that are infected by, by fungi. There were a few uh, uh, papers published in the 70s and 80s by one of my mentors, Harry, Harry Evans. And he had described some of these ant genera. But, and after my work, we increased it in almost 50% this, this genera. And I'm pretty confident that as we keep studying these, it's, it will never end, basically. You have generations to keep studying these and we'll still find very interesting things. So here it's just to uh, illustrate a little bit how is the process of describing a new species. So the part one is collecting them and photograph them in situ. So we have them really beautiful and fresh. The structures are not dry, so they, everything looks natural. So I photograph them in the field. Then I bring them to the lab. So this lab can be in the field or, or in a proper lab. So sometimes we don't have a proper lab in the Amazon to work. So we have to work on uh, improvised labs in a boat, as I showed, or in hotel rooms in, in, in some cases. But the ideal is to bring them to the, the lab to do these cross sections and take fo these photographs of the microscopy of them and these spores. So we study their morphology really in depth and try to not just describe the, the, the morphology, but also to understand what's the function of this morphology, why that spore looks like that, why that structure looks like that. It has to have a function. And to do that, we have to understand the host biology as well. And so the, the next step is deposit in the herbarium. And the next step below is deposit all the images online. So I can send a link. I have a Flickr account with, I, I wouldn't say all my, my pictures, but I have many of my pictures there. So I will, I will share the link at the end. So you can, you can easily uh, access there and use these images as, as whatever you want. <laughs> So just uh, showing a little bit how was the, 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 the knowledge on the diversity of these fungi just five years ago. So the, the zombie ants are the, the, these blue. So we, we, we had few species described less than 10, five years ago, but we didn't, we didn't have almost any knowledge on the phylogenetic diversity. So phylogenetic diversity is we can only access when we extract their DNA and, and build these trees. So building these trees, we know which species are related to which species. So we know who is close related to whom. And then we can understand how species related to each other and to other species as well. And after my work in five, in five years, so we made that tiny phylogeny with two, three names into these two big phylogenies. So on the left, there is the classic zombie ants, the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. And on the right is the, what we call neocordyceps, which is a group within ophiocordyceps. And they also have ant parasites that change the behavior of the host. So I will show in the next slides, what's the difference between the behavior manipulation in one group and another group. So behavior manipulation is present in all the species in this group. So every species, fungal species, will drive the host to die in a specific locations to fungus to develop. If this ant is on the ground, we have tested that, the fungi will not develop. It will only develop if it is in that precise location. So each species has a really, really precise place to die. So a, a short story, I was working for National Geographic once and we wanted to, it was six years, seven years ago, was before that, that movie. 
So they, they wanted to have a time lapse to show the fungi growing over time. So the, the biggest challenge was to bring the, the fungi closer to us and to be able to photograph them with all the professional uh, cameras and, and fancy things. But if we move, if we detach the leaf where the, the, the ant was biting and move just a few meters away, the fungi stop growing. It will, will not, not stop. So we keep recording, but the fungi was just there. So, and then we moved all the equipment into the forest and then we could record the, the fungi growing. So it really, really requires a re very specific microhabitat. And extended phenotype is just an uh, expression coined by Richard Dawkins to illustrate a phenomenon where the genotype of the parasite is expressed in the phenotype of the host. So this means that the genes, the fungal genes is being expressed in the ant. So this um, phenomenon where the ants leave the nest, climb onto a plant and bite, this is called, this is a phenotype. So, and the DNA of the fungi is causing this in the end. So that's why we call extended phenotype. And in order to understand how this uh, behavior manipulation arose, I, I did again a phylogeny of these fungi. So I have built the most comprehensive phylogeny of the group, as we see here on the left, is a really long uh, thing, is a phylogenetic tree. And we see that one part is highlighted in, in orange called Ophiocordyceps there. That's what you're seeing in the, in the middle of the screen. As I mentioned before, they, they evolved from an ancestral infecting beetle larva. And then in the number three, in the, in the tree, <laughs> number three, we can see that they jump from number two, sorry. They jump from beetle to ants, which is uh, illustrated in uh, the red. Uh, branches here. So once they jumped from beetle to ant, they diversified. But how this took place in the evolution? So social immunity played a really uh, important role on this association because we found that the ancestor of the zombie ants infected beetle larvae in the soil. We see here on the, the bottom left this uh, picture of a forest. The number one, we have a log on the forest floor. That's where still extant species of um, uh, Ophiocordyceps kill their hosts. Still nowadays, if you go to the forest, the beetle parasites will kill the hosts in these uh, logs because it's where the, the, the beetle larvae are, right? So the beetles lay the eggs in these logs and the eggs hatch and then they, the fungi infect the, the, the larva there. But this is also, the, 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 the place where the carpenter ants, these ants that get infected by the fungi, nests, especially their uh, ancestral lineages. So ancestral lineages of these ants also nest on the ground, on trunks. So this means that both the um, beetle larva and the ancestral of these ants were coexisting in the same niche. We, 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 we call this niche overlap. So they lived in the same area. So this means that the parasites of the beetle, which is the ancestor of all of these fungi, were infecting beetle. It was indirectly in contact with ants that also inhabit these logs. So this created an opportunity to the fungus that infect uh, beetle larva to jump to infect ants. So once this jump took place, this fungal lineage found a really, really, uh, bad environment for them because ant colonies are really protective. So, and they have one feature called social immunity. And then we go to social immunity. So social immunity is the ability that the ants have, the ant societies have to recognize pathogens and threats inside the nest as a group and act as a group to remove that threat from the, the, the nest. And ants are able to recognize other ants that are infected by the fungus. So once the, the other ants find that one of the workers are infected by the fungus, they will kill that ants, rip them apart and throw in the garbage, um, the garbage part of the nest or throw them out of the nest. So this means that the, the fungus just jump from beetle to uh, ants 
it wouldn't be able to develop because as I said, it needs a really specific place to develop. So one lineage was selected and this lineage that was selected evolved the ability to um, remove these ant from the colony, thus avoiding the social immunity and place these ants just above the nest, which is uh, on the forest uh, picture here, the number two. You see that's a summit position compared to number one where the beetles uh, inhabit. So once one lineage of fungus was able to do that, it places the host there and shoot the spores on the forest floor, which infected ants that went out to uh, forage. So this was a perfect adaptation. So it just removed the host from the nest, avoiding social immunity, and placed them in an exactly precise location where the fungus can develop and shoot spores on the forest floor and infect other ants. So that's one hypothesis I have published uh, about how this um, behavior manipulation might have uh, evolved. But there are different types of behavior manipulation. Not just the one that dies on a climb up to the plant part and bites on to leaf. So on the left side here, we see turtle ants, Cephalotes atratus, the ant name, this is in the Amazon. And they nest on the, on the canopy. They don't nest on the forest floor. So they nest in the canopy and all these fungi, all these uh, ants that are infected, we see here on letter C, D, B, and E. So once they are infected, they, they go down. They went out from, from the nest to, to die on the base of trees. So dying on the base of tree makes a little bit of sense because when the rains come, it, the, the tree trunk act as a, like, uh, like a conducting all the water from the leaves downwards to the trunk. So this means the trunk is consistently wet. And the tree trunk is also the, 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 the bridge that the, these ants use from the nest to the forest floor to forage and, and to get uh, food and then come back to the nest. So that's a, uh, uh, a pathway that these ants use all the time. So if the fungus is able to place these infected ants onto this base of the tree, so whenever these ants go up and down to forage, they will get potentially in contact with these fungi and get infected eventually. So this is another really interesting strategy to infect to place the host in a location that will be most, uh, most likely to infect other ants and transmit the spores to others. And on the right side, those are the classic zombie ants, but even within the zombie ants, the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, we have a fine tune bit, uh, across different species. For example, in letter A, we see just one fungus coming out with this uh, fruiting body coming out, but the ant is, is, is we can say buried is underneath the, this moss carpet. So this ensures humidity as well. So this is really great for the fungus. And fungi that infect uh, really tiny ants, about two or three millimeters, I invariably find them uh, killing the host at the tip of palm spines, as we see here on letter D and E. And so this makes sense as well, because we have the tree, and, and the, the spines are always pointing downwards in these species. So this means that every single morning, the, a drop of dew is formed on, the, on the, the tip of these spines, as we can see here on D and E. So that ensures that every single morning, the fungus will have its supplies of water and will grow happy. So otherwise it will be drier and probably not having the microclimate that is necessary for the fungus to grow. So these fungi were really smart to, well, I wouldn't say smart because they, they don't know what they're doing, but the lineages, that were, um, the, the lineages that were able to place the fungi in that locations were really successful and they could, they could be, uh, still happen in nature as we can see, because they were really well adapted to, to the environment and to collect water and get everything it needs to grow and transmit spores. This is one of my favorite species. I found it in 2018 in the Amazon. So this is again uh, one case where the ants nest on the canopy and die at the base of the trunk, at the, at the base of the tree. So whenever the, the, the fungus kill, the, the, the fungus infect 
the, the ant, it will drive the ant to bite onto the, this moss that is on the base of the trunk. But this case is particularly interesting because the sporophyte, which is the structure that produces spores in the moss, it looks very, very, very similar to the fruiting body of the fungus. So the, the fungus that grows out from the, the, the back of the, of the, the, the head of the ant looks really, really similar to the sporophyte. As we can see here on the right image, the top image is the fungus and the bottom image is the, the, the moss. So they're striking, strikingly similar. And, and again, these fungi are like this size, they're millimeters. So they're really, really similar. It's really difficult to find them. But the question is wh why the fungus is invariably leading the host to die exactly on this moss that looks exactly like the fungi. So this is a question that I, I, I didn't have the chance to answer yet, but my plan is to set up some uh, cameras, night cameras and day cameras around this tree and follow what's going on, what's happening in this, with these fungi. Is there something taking the, the, the spores up there to the, 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 ca the canopy or no? So we have no idea. So that's a question that will be answered in the next years, hopefully. Now, I, I, I want to show a comparison with, uh, about the development, comparing uh, tropical places and temperate places. So here we'll compare Amazonian species and the species I described from South Carolina, which got frozen during the winter. So here we see that in only in three days, the fungi grows really fast. In three days, it has a decent site and already producing asexual spores in that stalk. But if we compare, the life cycle of the temperate species in, in South Carolina, it takes up to one year to mature. So it will get infected and bite into the, the tree on the day one. And only in the day 113, these uh, sexual uh, parts, these uh, round black structures are produced. And then they get by November, December and January, they got frozen. So they stopped growing. They got frozen for until let's say March or April. And then only in June or July, they will be able to, to be mature and produce and shoot the spores into the environment, the sexual spores. So it's really contrasting if we, we compare species in the Amazon that complete their life cycle in one month compared to uh, uh, temperate species that uh, requires over one year to complete their life cycle and transmit the spores to the next host. So my question was, which one came first? Why, why some species bite leaves and why other species bite twig? So here we have a, map, a world map and, and we have uh, uh, plotted here the records for, for these ants. So we have in, in Brazil and South America, North America, a uh, few records I made in, in, in Ghana and some in, in Asia and in, in Australia as well. So if we, 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 we can clearly see that in the tropics, uh, they are predominantly biting onto leaves. This one in Ghana that has a, a brown uh, pin has a, it's a single specimen that I found in Ghana biting onto a trunk and not onto a leaf. So this is a, a total outlier, but I had to include it. So this is letter C. So this ant was biting onto a trunk. But we can see that consistently, all, basically all the records in the tropics are of ants biting onto um, leaves. But if we compare the US and, and Canada and even Japan, so th those species bite onto twigs because th if they bite onto leaves, uh, as I showed, they, they need one whole year to complete their life cycle. So if they bite onto leaves, when the fall comes, the leaves will fall on the ground and the fungus cannot develop. So the biting onto a, a, a twig was an adaptation that arose to uh, expand their uh, distribution as, were, as they were moving uh, uh, far from the, from the tropics, they had to adapt to these new environments and biting onto twig instead of a leaf was one of the key innovations that enabled them to survive into, into these cold places. So again, a phylogeny on the left, this is a tree based on molecular data and the ones in colored are the, 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 the zombie ant clade. And here 
in green means a species that bite onto leaf and brown means a species that bite into twig. And we see that that uh, ability to bite onto twigs arose at least three times independently, number one, two, and four. So, and this was in response to the, the, the environment. Once in the US and Canada, North America, another one in Africa. So there were in Asia, sorry, in Japan. So they had two different lineages that evolved the same strategy to persist in the cold environment, but they evolved that independently. That's quite interesting, I think. And that's what we, we showed in this uh, paper. So now just to wrap up a little bit of uh, the, the end part, and I will show uh, a few other projects. I'm working on other um, groups of organisms. And here are some uh, conclusions or things that we learned from uh, studying the zombie ants. So we know that we now know that some insect groups are hotspots for fungal diversity, while others remain uh, uninfected, even if they 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 inhabit the same area. So this is really interesting, and that's one of the questions I want to ask along my career. So why some hosts are magnets for fungal infection, while other hosts are totally free of infection? So there might be. Uh, features in these insects that makes them susceptible for fungal infections or not. And the diversity of entopathogenic fungi is still largely unknown because the curve never is flattened. So every time we go to the field, we find new species, new species, new species. It never gets like that. So it's always more and more species. So we have lots of species to describe. Tax assembly is important to create a robust phylogenetic framework because if we don't find new species and we don't um, insert these new species into these phylogenies, we, we call phylogenetic framework, which is a phylogeny that we can ask questions on that phylogeny. So we need to feed that uh, phylogenetic trees with more species, more species to get more and more close to the real diversity. And then taxa sampling and describing more species is really important to ask more, more uh, I wouldn't say deeper questions, but more complex questions regarding the, the, the life and evolution of this fungi. And that zombie ants likely evolved from a bitter larva parasite that lives in logs, like I, I showed, that's an hypothesis. And the insect zombification or the behavior manipulation likely occurred in response to a strong social immunity displayed by ant colonies, which is called the superorganism, as I explained. And the environmental conditions shape the behavior manipulation caused by fungi on their hosts. So what about other host groups? Now I will just uh, quickly go through some of other projects I'm, I'm currently working right now that uh, relates to the entomopathogens, but in other groups. So those are called acantomyces. It's another fungal genera, more close related to cordyceps than to ophiocordyceps. This, this is the family Cordyceptaceae, <clears throat> as we can see on the bottom right here, I showed this uh, figure before. So this group is, is comprised on the vast majority by uh, parasites of adult moths. So this is really rare in, in, in entomopathogens. So this is when you find uh, adult moth infected by a fungus, you can 95% of chance to be an acantomyces. So I'm, here I'm describing many species in this group, and we'll also uh, increase our knowledge on the, the phylogeny of them, and then we can ask other types of questions. And there is only one outlier here, which is this cricket that is infected by acantomyces, I found. And this is really strange. We, we have no idea. This was a, uh, an example of host junk, where the, the group, uh, the species within acantomyces infect moths, but in a single exception for now, they jump from moths to crickets, and they also can infect crickets. So this is really interesting host jump. Yeah, so th this is a group, Acantomyces, I was talking about in the phylogeny. And that's really, really interesting because that's one ecological novelty that we found. This is my project. They're still uh, ongoing in Japan. So here I will describe many species of these fungi infecting uh, cicadas, and but that yeah, I thought this image would pop up, and 
this is a project I'm working on, on cicada parasites. But on the right side, you can see this glowing insect. This is a technique called FISH. It's a fluorescence in situ hybridization, which means that we develop some molecule. I'll make it simple. We develop some molecules that shine in a special microscope. So we develop uh, markers that glows in yellow for bacteria. So these uh, yellow markers will attach to bacteria. And, and with, no, I'm sorry, the, the pink one. The pink one is bacteria and the yellow one attached to the, the fungi, to Ophiocordyceps. So in this, this technique here can, can, can show us that inside this um, uh, hemipteran insect, this is a nymph, and there is a big community of these fungi working to, uh, in beneficial to, the, to these insects, while the, the bacteria in, 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 in pink, it's also beneficial, but the fungi, uh, the fungi uh, replace another bacteria. Originally, there were two types of bacteria, but then the fungi came, and instead of being parasitic, they, they replaced this bacterial community and started to play the role that bacteria used to play in these insects, which is providing uh, amino acids and, and other, uh, other compounds that the insect cannot uh, metabolize and produce themselves. So the fungi, instead of killing them, are now helping them to, 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 to survive because these insects feed from really poor uh, uh, nut, nut, nutrient poor uh, food, let's say food. And, and this is a really interesting technique where we can see inside the, the, the insect body. So that's really, that's something that I really wanna jump in, into the, in, in the future to study how these uh, fungi can be also beneficial inside this insect. This was discovered two, two years ago. This is really, really new. And here, as we can see, it's really interesting that it, these ants on the left are not only infected by the fungi, but all this white fungus we see is a mycoparasite that is infecting the zombie ant fungus. So we have the ant, and we have the, 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 the Ophiocordyceps that grows out of their, 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 the back of their head, right? But we found another fungus that infects these Ophiocordyceps. So now we have the ants and the fungus, and the another fungus infect the fungus. And, and those are, are, are really, really interesting because they evolved multiple times as well. We see that each of these dots are uh, one origin of this fungi. So here's one uh, new genus I'm describing now, a uh, species of mycoparasite I found here in, in Florida. So it's really, really interesting. So it will be a new genus on the, on the uh, basal part of this tree. So here's just a few examples of these uh, mycoparasites. So they're really beautiful as well. I think they're beautiful. <laughs> and a variety of other arthropods. So all of these lineages I, I marked here are complex of species. So we, we call them complex of crypt, cryptic species. So a group of fungus that looks really similar, but when we look at their microscopy or their genetics, we can see that they are actually not one species, but many species. So, and that, that happened with the, the zombie ant fungus because people thought it was Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, just one species. And then we started to look at their morphology and we found they are totally different species with different strategies of infection, different ecologies, very, very different. And this complex of species occur not only on ants, but there are complex of multiple species of fungus infecting ants, spiders, cockroaches, moths, uh, um, moths and spiders and many other groups of arthropods. So there are still a lot to be studied. And I'm really looking forward to have my lab and getting my students because only one person cannot do, do the job. So I'm really looking forward to, to have others to help me with this task. So, and of course, now to wrap up, reaching out the general public. So th that's what I'm trying to do right now. And also what I have done in the past as well. So these fungi are really uh, photogenic and charismatic. 
So I have worked with National Geographic in a documentary that I, I have mentioned. So this end here, we have to go to the forest and, and make all the setup in the forest. And we can see that the fungi will grow soon. So this is something that I'm really interested in as well. So if some, someone here is interested to uh, work on documentaries or if interested on these type of things, so I will be glad to talk about that because I have plans to develop these type of things in my, my new lab. So doing these uh, uh, documentaries and, and this kind of uh, outreach type of things. And it also featured in, in other places, like Sam uh, mentioned, uh, the girl with all the gifts. So it is featured in the mirror, as we see here, in National Geographic, and last year in New York Times. So people are really, really interested to, to know more about this fungi. So this is really good. And this can, can also be a really great tool to uh, advertise the, the fungal way of life to, to the broad public. And not only to, to us that are fungal lovers, but to people that are not uh, in principle interested in fungi, but they might become a, a fungal expert just because they read something like I did. I watched a movie on YouTube and here I am working on fungi 15 years later. And even in China, so they, they feature this story on zombie ants in the National Geography of China. I cannot read, but the, the pictures look, look good. All right, so some acknowledgements, my uh, PhD advisor, David Hughes and Harry Evans, and my wife and daughter that has the patience to share my attention with the fungi for all these years. So thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed 